American West. Once it could have been the British, Spanish, or even the Russian West. It became American primarily because of the explorations of two young army officers, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. Their pioneering journey stands as one of the great achievements in the history of the United States. I made sign talk with the river people about food. They don't have any to spare, not even to sell. At least we'll have Quamish roots to eat. Janie went out to dig some. Roots are all right temporarily, but uh, the men can't go without meat very long and keep up their strength. If Gruyere and the hunters come in empty-handed again, why not kill one of our horses? The poorest one. Really, the way it is, all of us except Bratton will have to walk over the Lolo Pass. We have just enough horses to tote the baggage. Well, we could all ride if we could bring Chief Twisted Hair to an accounting. Last fall, we left 30 good horses with him. Do you realize that? Tell me, Billy, how do you bring a man to an accounting when he deliberately avoids you? Captain Clark? Thought you ought to know, sir, there's a score of Nespers heading this way. Well, who's leading them? Twisted Hair, Cut Nose? No chief, sir. Just a couple of braves, mostly squaws, children, and old people. I wonder what they want. Oh. Remember me? Uh, wait a minute. Uh, let me think. I come coming, warrior. You fix leg. You pull heart straight and out. Give stinging water to rub on. Of course. Now I must fall. You're the one who learned white man's talk from traders on the Columbia, yes. It is good. Come, come, tell everybody how you make him well. You great medicine man. These people, all sick, all come to be cured. Horizons West. The continued story of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Now with Harry Bartell as Meriwether Lewis and John Anderson as William Clark, listen to Chapter 10, Decision at Traveler's Rest. May 8, 1806. The Lewis and Clark expedition, after a relatively easy trip from the Walla Walla country in southeastern Washington, was encamped on the banks of the Clearwater River in Nez Perce country, not far from what is now the city of Lewiston, Idaho. Ahead were the formidable Rockies. The crossing would be through the Lolo Pass, where there was never food for man or beast, even in the summer. Now the pass was choked with snow. If nature was kind and permitted the rigorous three-day passage within the month, Lewis and Clark would reach St. Louis this year. If nature chose to be unkind and delayed them two months... But neither captain wanted to think about that possibility. The Indians looked at Billy as if he were a miracle worker and prepared to display their ill. He got out his medicines and his instruments. Mara, whether you know more about doctoring than I do, you ought to be doing this. They put their faith in you, Billy. Stand by, anyhow. I uh, might need a consultant. I'll give you one piece of advice right now. We're out of trade goods. We can't buy any necessaries from these people, not unless they pay you for doctoring. I'll remember. Uh, come, come, who's first? Uh, uh, this squaw, the wife of war chief, has great pain in back. Tell her husband we are poor in food and poor in horses. Tell him we will welcome any payment he can make. The squaw had a severe abscess which Billy lanced, drained, and dressed. The easing of pressure gave her almost immediate relief, and her grateful husband promised to bring us a horse in the morning. Except for a girl with a broken forearm, the other complaints were minor. Sore eyes, strained muscles, constipation. Billy treated these from three bottles, eye wash, horse liniment, and Dr. Rush's purgative pills. At last he finished. Comcomish herded the patients away just as George Druyar and the hunters returned with three deer. 
What filly? Three deer. Well, things are improving. Now, if we could only get our horses from Twisted Hair, we'd be in good shape. No time like right now. No. Well, what can you do now? I have an idea. Would you find Kamkamish for me? He's right over there. Kamkamish! Come here. George, you came in past Twisted Hair's camp? Yes, sir. He is there. He is soaking in his lug. I want you to go back. Ask him to visit us tonight, Will. Smoke the pipe, eat together, talk. Captain Clark, you want come come here? Uh, yes. Captain Lewis and I want you to stay. Be our interpreter. Big powwow tonight with Twisted Hair. George, after you visit Twisted Hair, go on to Chief Cutnose. Invite him here to smoke and eat and talk. Twisted Hair and Cutnose? Both of them? Both of them. Charbonneau and New York set about cooking the venison. Jenny brought in as many pomish roots as she could carry. She put the roots into pots of water suspended over one of the fires. The minutes of waiting compounded into an hour. Meriwether grew restive. What had happened to George Rouillard and the Nez Perce chiefs? George could have made the round trip twice by now. I hope he didn't run into trouble. Captain Lewis, Charbonneau says supper's about ready to eat. Go ahead and feed the men, but save enough venison and roots for us and uh, Drew Yar and I guess. Yes, sir. Tell Charbonneau to keep our portions warm. Right, sir. All right, I'll keep the portions warm. Well, there's somebody. Twisted hair. All by himself. It means George is with cut nose. Come, come in. Here, Captain Lewis. I read you. Welcome, Chief of the Nez Perce. Welcome, Twisted Hair. We passed the pipe back and forth, and then sat down before Charbonneau's always excellent cooking. As he ate, Twisted Hair smiled happily and made the sign of friendship repeatedly. Then he turned to Kamkamish and spoke in Nez Perce. Uh, Captain Lewis, Twisted Hair say he happy to see white friends. White man's food, good. White man's tobacco, good. White men, Nez Perce, friends. Ask him if his quarrel with Chief Cutnose concerns us. Kamkamish spoke to Twisted Hair. The chief listened, frowned, and replied with some heat. Kamkamish nodded soberly and turned to Meriwether. A uh, quarrel about white men's horses, over honor of guarding them, over use of them. Chief Broken Arm and Chief Cutnose, each allowed to share care and use. Cutnose not careful, his young men scatter horses all over nation. Tell him the horses must be rounded up fast. Ask about the saddles we cast here last fall. Tom Kamish relayed the statement to Twisted Hair. The Nez Perce chief spoke rapidly with a great sincerity evident in his manner. Tom Kamish listened carefully, considering how to put this torrent of words into his limited English. Then he spoke. Captain, chief Twisted Hair, give word... He get horses back. In cash, ground fall on saddles. Twisted hair save. He put in new dry hold. Then George Duryar rode in with Chief Cutnose. They dismounted and came over to the fire. Welcome, Chief Cutnose. Sit down, both of you. Smoke with us. Eat. Cutnose glared at Twisted Hair, waved aside the peace pipe offered by Druyar, and grabbed up some venison. He ate voraciously, pausing now and then to spit out Nesper's words, which sounded like curses. Uh, Captain Clark, Captain Lewis, Cutnose say he true friend to whites, but Twisted Hair is bad, a man of two faces. He let young braves spoil white man's horses by hard riding. Braves would kill horses, but Cutnose say. Come, Kamish, tell Cutnose I am sad. He and Twisted Hair are quarreling. Captain Clark is sad. We want our friends to be friends of each other. We know that as brothers they can do anything. Together they will find our horses. Let them make their white friends happy. Let them smoke together. Both the chiefs responded to Meriwether's plea. Cutnose put aside his food long enough to take the pipe from George. He smoked and passed it on to Twisted Hair. He smoked. 
All was well, except we still didn't have our horses. Billy's fears about the horses turned out to be groundless. Twisted hair and cut nose were honest men. We visited them in turn the very next day and got back our saddles and 21 of the horses in good condition. Their braves helped round up the remaining animals during the next few days until we lacked only two. The two horses taken by old Toby and his sons as a fee for guiding us over the mountains last fall. Then a messenger arrived from the great chief of all the Nez Perce, the broken arm. He say, you come his village. All Nez Perce people send chiefs and warriors there to welcome great white captains. On May 10th, we reached the broken arms village and were pleased to see that over it flew the American flag we had given him last fall. The village was on high ground with a fine view of the still impassable Rocky Mountains. Representatives from all seven Nez Perce tribes were there. It was our chance to speak out for the policy of peace and friendship Thomas Jefferson wanted the Indians to adopt. My friends, we have smoked the pipe together. We have pledged ourselves to live in peace and harmony with each other. This is the policy of the great chief Thomas Jefferson of the 17 states of America whence I come. Let me draw you a picture on the earth before your feet of this great nation to which I belong and how it relates to you and other Western people. While his words were translated into the Nez Perce tongue, Meriwether took up a stick and drew a map from the ground and made the sign for all to look at. Look, my friends, here... All this great area, this is the United States. Here is the Big River Mississippi and the Big River Missouri. Here live the Nez Perce and their immediate neighbors, the Shoshones, the Blackfeet, Minotauris, Pakis. All of you are under the protection of the great Thomas Jefferson, just as each of the 17 states is protected by him. We must all keep the peace. When Blackfoot or Minotauri lifts his lance against Shoshone or Nez Perce, it is an affront to Great Chief Jefferson. It is an affront to all who want the good life. Only in time of peace can traitors come among you and bring you white man's goods to make your lives easier and richer and better. Now, so I may tell the great President Jefferson of the intent of his Nez Perce friends, I ask you to tell me whether you want to fight with your neighbors or live with them as brothers. I ask you to vote either for war or for peace. The voting procedure, set up by order of Great Chief the Broken Arm, was unique and followed Nez Perce tradition. To signify approval, the Braves helped themselves to food from the tribal kettle. To show disapproval, they stood aloof. The approvals far outnumbered the disapprovals. It is good. The vote is for peace. The broken arm informed us after the big powwow that his scouts had reported snows in the Lolo Pass were still so deep we could not go through. We would have to wait several weeks, and we might as well spend the time in comfort. A commodious deerskin lodge would be provided for Billy and me. The level of the nearby river, checked daily, would be an accurate gauge of how fast the mountain snows were thawing. And we were free to kill as many of the broken arms' numerous horse herd as we might need for food. We also learned, after we accepted his hospitality, that word of Billy Clark's medical prowess had reached the area. The sick lined up each morning for treatment. Well, another group gone away happy, sir. And they all paid in food. That's the way it is, Ordway. Feast or famine... You know, you'd make a pretty good country doctor even back home, Captain. Nonsense. If I were any good, I'd be able to cure Private Bratton. Yeah, poor Private Bratton. Did I hear somebody mention Bratton? Yes, I've got to look in on him. I just did. If anything, he's weaker. Then that salve I gave him last week hasn't helped. Pine resin, beeswax, and bear oil, wasn't it? Yes. Well, all it did was give him a rancid smell. 
Bratton says Johnny Shields has been talking to him about an Indian sweat bath cure. Indian sweat bath? It'll kill him. Maybe not. He'll die anyway in the Lolo Pass. Billy, why don't we ask him? Well, might as well. Bratton was under a canvas lean-to stretched out on a couch of pine boughs. He didn't look bad lying there. His color and flesh were good. But when he tried to stand, he collapsed. Uh. I, I, I don't know what it is, sir. Ain't much pain except a small on my back. You think you can sit up for maybe an hour? Well, I, I can try, sir. Why? Captain Clark and I want to give you an Indian sweat bath. Johnny Shields was talking about it. You, you sure it'll cure me? I'm not sure at all. It's your last chance, Bratton. Well, I, I guess a long chance is better than no chance at all. Johnny Shields and Drew Yar helped Sergeant Ordway dig a hole in a clear area along the riverbank. That's deep enough, wouldn't you say, Billy? Four feet deep, four foot square, sir. That's about right, Sergeant Ordway. Uh, build a fire on the bottom. Yes, sir. When it uh, gets good and hot, in you go, Bratton. And then you can make your own steam, drawing water on the sides of the hole. You're telling me it'll be that hot? Well, you'll cook me like a side of beef. No, 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 we won't. Uh, Captain, he ought to have something to drink while he's down there. Uh, suppose you make him some hot mint tea. Hot? That's what the captain said. When the hole was hot enough, Shields shoveled out the fire. We built a rock seat about a foot off the bottom, and it was ready. I looked around. Ringing us were about 30 Indians. I decided to ignore them. Got the water for steam, Ordway? Yes, sir. Here goes. Mint tea? Right here, sir. Now, when he's in, cover the top with blankets. You sure you want to go in there, Bratton? No, no, I I ain't sure at all. They're not forcing you. Do what great doctor chief say. Go in. Get well. Hey, come on, come on, Bratton. Hey, you don't want to disappoint the audience. Up to the devil with the audience. Oh, get in there. Sweat it out. Well, uh... I guess so. Well, all right, I'm ready. That's You'll good. be all right, Brett. Oh. Water on the bottom and sides, Ordway? Water on the bottom and sides, sir. <laughs> For supper, the roast brattle. <laughs> Shields and Ordway carefully lowered Bratton into the steaming hole. Quickly, we covered the top with blankets, lifting them partially now and then to provide Bratton with more tea or more water to make steam. Soon, he was all but obscured by a misty cloud. How are you doing, Bratton? I can't stand much more. It's pretty hot down there, Captain. Good, good. You think I should take him out, Merriweather? You're the doctor, Billy. I had no first-hand experience with this kind of thing. Neither have I. Ordway, you know the procedure to get him out? Yes, sir. Me and Shields lift him. Then we run him to the river and throw him in. I'll then get him back fast and into the hole again. All set, sir. Shields. Ready, sir. All right, take him out. We lifted him out and ran with him toward the river. No sooner had they thrown him in than they were pulling him out. All right, men, quick, back in the sweat hole with him. Oh, just let me die, will you? Let me die. Come on now, you can't quit. We let him sweat for another half hour or so, threw him in the water again, and then put him back in the sweat hole. When we took him out the final time, we wrapped him in blankets and cooled him off gradually. The next day, Bratton began improving. And in a week, he could walk with no trouble. We tried the same treatment on a paralyzed sub-chief the trusting Comcomish had brought to us. It cured him, too. And from then on, Chief the Broken Arm began to urge us to settle down permanently with his people. Comcomish, just what did he say about guides? You... We'll have guides when snow melts. Mm -hmm. But why you go? You and this person, brothers. We moved our camp farther into the uplands and made as many preparations as we could for the forced march across the pass. Johnny Shields, with the convalescent Bratton to help, overhauled the firearms of the expedition, but the rest of the men were not so fortunate. Without jobs, they did little more than cast amorous eyes at the more attractive of the Nez Perce women. Merriweather, they're looking like troops from old Fort Clatsop. We'll never get across the mountains with men who don't care. They need something to keep them busy. 
Remember how they were racing horses with the Indians at Twisted Hare's Village? That's a good idea. Better yet, let's have some foot races, burn up their energy. And get all kinds of games going. We held regular games with the Indians, and we didn't try to keep the men from betting on the outcome of these races, even if they occasionally lost an essential item like a hatchet or a knife. The most significant race of all to Billy and me was a sprint which Private Bill Bratton entered. Several of the men, including Shields and Ordway, felt that he was not ready to pit himself against half a dozen of the fastest Nez Perce runners. Bratton, however, insisted, and when the runners towed the starting line with Shields to send them off, Bratton was there. Ready! got off to a poor start, but he dug in hard and made up ground on the swift Indian. He passed several, one of whom tried to slow him down with a turning of elbow. But he got by and crossed the finish line a couple of strides behind the leaders in third place. Brutton, that's fine, fine boy. How do you feel? Good, sir. Real good. I guess you're cured, Bill. I guess you might even be ready for that Lolo pass. <laughs> Billy Clark and I kept daily watch on the water level in the river, which rose much too slowly for us. Obviously, it was a late winter, the one eventuality that could defeat our attempt to reach St. Louis before the end of the year 1806. On the 10th of June, we moved still nearer the mountains. We need another talk with the broken arm about guides. Yes, we do. Remind him of his promise. I'll send Drew Yard to talk to him in sign language. Why not come Kamish in his purse? I'm afraid he's biased. He wants us to stay. This time, with the exception of George Druyar, we sent out all our hunters to bring in as much meat as possible. George left for the camp of Chief the Broken Arm. Half a day, and George reported back to us, grim and unsmiling. Sorry, no guides. The chief say he is not letting us die up there in the snow drifts. Did you tell him we meant to leave? Guides or no guides? Yes, sir. He thought I was bluffing. A few weeks delay here means another winter will catch us in this upper Missouri country. We were over the Lolo Pass once, George. You were with the leaders then. We the uh, Indian guys, sir. You helped blaze trail. You ought to be able to lead us back. With what I can remember and what Captain Clark remembers. If you say so, sir, I try. 150 miles with no horse fodder. We'll have to try to make it in three days. We started into the mountains on the 15th of June, 1806. By evening, we had pushed to an elevation of almost a mile. Fortunately, the snow was hard-packed and crusted with ice. As long as the horses kept their feet, travel wasn't particularly difficult. That night, with a knife-edged wind slicing at us from the heights, was the coldest I can remember. We were up early and pressed on in the gray dawn. Doesn't look familiar. Sure doesn't. Those horses don't look happy. Morning, sirs. How does it look up front? Not familiar. Uh, to speak out, sir. I'm not sure where we are heading. How about the tree blazes? Buried under maybe four feet of the snow. I can take a chance if you make it in order, but I, uh, I rather not. I make a wrong guess, and I kill over 30 people and 60 horses. And you don't want that hanging over your head? No, sir. We have to get across. If we try again, maybe we can force the uh, Nez Perce, uh, to give us a guide. Perhaps talk to somebody else. Twisted air. Cut nose. It cost us at least two days, maybe more. We can leave the baggage here. Backtrack with only men and horses. I guess it's the only way. Let's get started. Aren't we? Yes! Fire! We stored our baggage and reserve food under tarpaulins along the snowy trail. Here in this wild and nearly lifeless area, these precious goods would be safe. Driar, meanwhile, hurried back to talk to Chief Cutnose about guides. Our retreat was marred by accidents. Coulter lost his blanket, 
John Potts was badly cut and I was hard put to stop the bleeding. We lost four horses and a mule. And the hunters ranging the lower altitudes only got two deer during a span of five days. Then, while our horses grazed near our old campgrounds, George Druyar at last appeared, this time with a broad smile on his face. Druyar! You look like good news, George. Sir, I got three guides. One of them is a brother of uh, Chief Cutnose. Excellent. What did it cost? Only two rifles and some shots. Where are they? Uh, coming up the trail, sir. On the 24th of June, we left again for the Lolo Pass, this time led by the three young Nez Perce Braves. Fortune favored the rest of the passage. It was very cold. The horses went with empty bellies. But on the 29th day of June, 1806, we started down the eastern slope of the mountains. Snow runs out about a mile ahead, according to the guide, sir. There's plenty of grass for the horses. Overnight stop by the forge, Sergeant. Yes, sir. The following day, after luxuriating in the wonderful warm waters of the low, low springs, we moved on to Traveler's Rest, where we had camped on the trip west. The hunters brought in several deer. That night, the men, bodies cleansed in the springs, stomachs full of good fare, were happy and relaxed. It was time to bring up a subject that... Meriwether and I had discussed time and again since Fort Clatsop. We made it just in time. We should reach St. Louis before the year's out. Missouri currents will be with us most of the way. No pauling, no towing, no prickly pear. Not as much, let's say. Nothing will be real good after we leave Shoshone country. I uh, hate to interrupt this optimistic talk, but you all must remember we had a bad time of it in this very country last summer and fall. Mainly because we didn't know enough about it. And we still don't. What Captain Clark is trying to say is we'll have to split up the Corps of Discovery a good part of the way home. In Blackfoot country, sir? Them and the Minotauris might jump smaller groups of men. We'll have to take that chance. Back at Fort Clatsop, when I made up the master map, I could see the blank spaces that we fill only by actual exploration. Well, that's what this amounts to. Filling in the blanks. Gash, you'll go with me and we'll take eight men. We'll go directly to the Missouri where three men will make trucks for the portage around the Great Falls. With the others, I'll explore Mariah's River. Ordway, you'll go with me up the Bitterroot Valley, over the divide then to Three Forks. There, you'll take nine men down the Missouri to meet up with Captain Lewis, while I take the rest of the party explore the Yellowstone River. We should all meet where the Yellowstone joins the Missouri. All I can say is I hope the Indians have hibernated. After the men had gone silently and glumly to their bedrolls, Billy Clark and I sat by the fire, a map spread between us. I know the men are depressed. Because they've endured so much together. It can't be helped. There's no time to cover all this country in one body. been listening to Horizons West, the continued story of the Lewis and Clark Expedition. Chapter 10, Decision at Traveler's Rest, starred Harry Bartell as Meriwether Lewis and John Anderson as William Clark. Featured in the cast were Carl Swenson, Eddie Firestone, Jim Bowles, and Clark Gordon. Our story was written by Carl A. and William Tunberg and directed by William Lally. Sound patterns by Gene Twombly. Michael Rye speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.